What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. I'm also a certified empowerment coach, president and CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching Communications. And it's been a minute since I've been on live because there's just so many things going on in a positive way on the Dr. Vibe journey, which means everyone who's watching this, you're part of my fam. So I'm doing things to raise the bar and carry you with me but we have another new friend on the dr vibe show tonight the home of epic conversations i'm the host of epic conversations i heard about this gentleman about i'd say about a year or two ago uh, and actually had his email address in my contact list so i don't know if i reached out to him but about two weeks ago someone said hey dr vibe this is going on in toronto are you going I said, well, I better go because I'm a black man and I very much care about the area of black masculinity. So tonight we have Warren Clark, who is the curator of the Barbershop Talk series. Now he's doing volume two coming up on July 11th in three different cities in Canada. So if you can't make it out live, you'll be able to watch it live stream. But we're going to find out a little bit about Warren, some of his journey, some about the Barber Talk barbershop talk series and also get some conversation going about black masculinity so welcome to the dr vibe show for the first time but not the last time mr warren clark how are you sir i'm very well thank you very much for having me um appreciate uh being on the dr vibe show it's an opportunity and i'm humbled for the uh this opportunity well we're really glad to have you on it's uh like i said i the initial barbershop series i don't know what happened but we're together now, bottom yeah. line. We're together now, which is the most important thing. So what we like to do, with, like with all new friends on the Dr. Vibe show, is I'd like to find a little background about yourself. So tell us a little bit of Warren before he had a beard. Okay, uh, I had dreads. That's and, and, well, that's something we didn't know. That's, yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, before the beard. So there's a story behind cutting my hair and uh, in connection or tied to the whole barbershop talk. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, so November of uh, 2017, uh, my uncle passed away uh, from stomach cancer. And um, so I, I in not only in honor of, of him, but just um, a new chapter in my life, I, I decided to cut my hair. Um, it was a it was my decision. I wasn't pressured to, um, and I say that to to say you know um, you know in cutting my hair, I, I started understanding the the relationship between um, the barber and the client. Um, before I go any further, I, I get to your first question. I am a PhD student at uh, Carleton University. I'm going into my third year. Um, Hopefully by the end of the summer I'll be a candidate instead of student, uh, just working towards my exams. So anywho, my research focus is looking at race, ethnicity, um, gender, specifically black masculinity, um, also youth cultures. Uh, so I look at young black men um, and their experiences uh, in the Canadian context. Um, also solidarity and uh, youth work. So I've done a range of many things under my research experience. Um, just want to acknowledge that. Uh, however, back to me cutting my hair, so uh, I cut my hair in November and didn't realize how important it was to cut my hair in, in, uh, in a barber shop with uh, a barber who not only is easy to talk to, but also someone you can relate to on many different topics, either basketball, sexuality, um, the list goes on and on. And um, visiting the barber shop that I particularly went to was called The Right Cut here in, in Ottawa, uh, Ontario. Um, I threw it in there a few more times and, you know, we got in some rich conversation. I say we, the barbers, myself, and people um, in, the, in, in the in the waiting area. And uh, it, I, I thought it would be a cool idea. I've done discussions, something similar to Barbershop in the past, uh, which organizers, uh, organizers uh, have done a great job of doing. Um, and this Barbershop talk is not a new idea, so I don't want to take claim of fame for it. something that has been working well in the States and continues to work well in the United States. Uh, and in some parts of, of Canada, some people are using the barbershop as an outlet. However, uh, for me, and particularly what my interest is in research and just as a human, you know, human being, 
um, as a black man, is understanding what my masculinity represents for myself, but also what does it mean to be a black man in Canada? And I think what's important about having these rich conversations about black masculinity is not only to set the tone, but define what that means in a Canadian context. I think uh, more times where we talk about black masculinity, it's um, I mean, there's narratives from the United States, from the United States, which do apply. However, what it, what does that mean in the Canadian context? So um, that's how barbershop really started in terms of my experience, and then thinking outside the box and how we can talk about this as a community um, and understand what are the 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 common but general and plaguing, continuing plaguing stereotypes uh, against black men, especially you know men, um, black men, young black men, and men themselves. So um, the barbershop talk is not just a defining what black masculinity is, but understanding what it means in our community. And, and once we put um, an understanding, it can then give an opportunity for people not only to discuss, but take away teachable moments from the barbershop meetings where you say, hey, you know what, I didn't think about that in that perspective of what, for instance, Dr. Vibe said when he said when he's going to the July 11th show um, event in Toronto. So it gets people thinking, gets people engaged, um, and it also gets people um, included in a conversation who are not just academics, they're community members, they're all from all walks of life. So the barbershop is to encourage um, encourage people, the public, and, and just trying to, try to create awareness of how to better our communities, um, but also understanding how to understand you know, black men and how some of the stereotypes that, uh, that continue to play black men are misconceptions. Excellent. Well, I'm going to go even want to go further back. I want you to, if whatever you're comfortable with, to share some of your life growing up as a young black man. What was that experience like? Where did you grow up? What was family like? What was community like when you were much younger? Yeah, so I am originally from Toronto, uh, Ontario. I've been in many parts of Toronto, um, more so in North York, if anybody's familiar with that area. Yeah. Um, I am I have a father who's still in my life, and I have a mother who's still in my life. Um, they're great people, great human beings. I respect them and love them dearly. They've helped me in terms of um, develop my own masculinity. Um, in terms of where where I started with uh, understanding who Warren is, I wasn't so so poised and so um, uh, encouraging of myself to, to pursue any education at a young age. To be very honest with you, I didn't even think I'd be doing a doctorate. To be very clear with you, and those who know me uh, would probably say the same thing. Um, but this is something that uh, I, I pursue and something that I, I love doing with research. However, uh, with growing up, my masculinity, if I can start there, was, was shaped and developed through my peers, um, indirectly, directly, uh, my mother, uh, my aunts, um, my dad at times, you know, uh, more times than not, I should say, even my uncle. So there was a combination of many influences that, Help me with understanding who I am and understanding how I understand my masculinity. Um, you know, even going, getting older and maturing, um, it's not only black people who have helped me understand who Warren is, but great mentors who are, are not black, who are white, who are East Indian, um, also contributed to my, my development as a human being, um, as an, even as an academic. So, um, growing up had different parts and they continue to and I always, always welcome different people in my life and my circle to add to my, my, my maturity and my development. Um, in terms of uh, you know where I went to school, I, I, I guess I'll start by saying uh, I did my bachelor at York University in Anthropology um, where I took uh, Public Issues Anthropology at University of Guelph for my Master's and now I'm doing my, ma my doctorate in Sociology. And like I said, I mentioned earlier, uh, I was not, I did not look at education as um, something that I, I pursued this long, at least. Um, it was something that uh, I, I took on when, um, around a time in my life where it was either learn and de develop more as a man or uh, continue working uh, nine to five, something that I wasn't really comfortable doing at that time. I'm not in a bad way, but, you know, I wanted more to life. And, the one thing that I, I challenge people, not only you know people I'm talking to, like yourself or anybody who else I talk to, is to encourage yourself and keep thinking positive uh, and understand that your development doesn't start, uh, start, stop, and start only at one one thing or one way. So, 
Um, hope that answers a little bit of your question in terms of sure. you know, my, my experience or my past. Absolutely. I want to know, you shared with us that ex education wasn't that much of a passion in your younger days. Mm -hmm. Where did the turn happen and where, who was involved, if anyone, in the turn for you to realize that education was now going to be part of your core? I, 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 like, you, I like that question. I like to start off by saying why education was not um, a foundation of my younger age. Um, and that, in my time, oh, geez, I sound old, but anyway. Um, <laughs> don't worry, you're younger than me, so don't don't go yeah. there. <laughs> I think it's the beer that throws me off sometimes. But, um, <laughs> you, um, you know, I was I, I encountered you know teachers, uh, vice principals, principals that told me straight to my face, point blank, you're not going to make it. You suck at your English. You suck at writing. You suck at you know just being a student. Your parent, your parents are lousy, quote unquote. Um, and then those experiences um, from an educator, you know, really threw me off and made, made me feel like I'm not going to accomplish anything. Um, and one of the reasons why I worked for so many years, I, was, I did a good job working uh, as a program manager and a project manager in the third-party call centers for many years. Um, it was when I got laid off uh, 10 years after you know, working so hard as a program manager and thinking to myself, you know, what's next? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name drop one individual, I'm not sure if he's listening, but I'm sure uh, um, he'll appreciate me saying this, because I'm going to talk, talk about him in a respectable way, um, is Mark Duhogan. Um Mark um, really challenged me in, in setting the bar high in terms of understanding who word is, but understanding how word is in relation to, to education. Um, so what Mark said to me one afternoon I'll never forget was, he asked me, how old do I want to live till? And I said, I'm going to live till 100. You know, I was being cocky. And uh, Mark said, if you invest four years in education, and you're 20, I was 29 at the time, four years in education, then the rest of the time is yours. Now, I took his challenge uh, literal because I'm still in school. But needless to say, he was a, a the bedrock and a great support um, at that time for me to understand how, it, or how education is important to me and, and what I can do with it. Not really knowing exactly at that time, but um, it was a start. So that's how I got into academia and uh, finding myself in anthropology and then now studying sociology and political economy uh, at Carleton University. So I'm, I'm glad that I took the, the challenge. One thing I want to circle back to, you had mentioned early in our conversation that your uncle had passed away, and we'd like to express condolences in regards to that. Thank so you. it's very, very important. One of the things I I notice from you is that you use your fight for fuel. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very interesting. Why did you choose the area of study, anthropology? Why that first? And was that something that was... Natural or did it? How did that start out? Come about? Okay, good question. Um, I actually, before starting my first year at York University, I didn't even know what anthropology was. Um, it was it was only until I took my my first ever my first course ever in university, which was anthropology introduction to anthropology, and I sat in the first I sat in the back row actually. Um, and the professor came in, and she played this video on anthropology, and it blew my mind. It, I didn't even know that this word I've never heard before at that time was so interesting, so nuanced, so um, so intriguing in terms of how you know anthropologists study cultures um, and study cultures in a way to understand them and apply practical recommendations in other areas of society or cultures to better them. So when I started understanding anthropology from that perspective. Um, I decided to uh, engage fully and, and, and commit to sociocultural anthropology. So I, look, I, I specifically look at cultures, um, and more so in the black community, uh, in terms of how, how, how they practice um, you know, different ways of living and what's the meaning behind um, their practices. Um, one of the reasons why I pursued anthropology and further was because of a course I took in, in undergrad called Public Issues Anthropology, which really encouraged students to use anthropological learnings or teachings or the discipline itself and use it in community development. 
Um, and I've been in the community working um, as a you know, youth worker uh, capacity. I've done a lot of mentoring, continue to do a lot of mentoring, uh, public speaking. So it, it fit well for me, and it also um, helped me understand what I can do in academia. Um, sociology, if I can just talk on that uh, point, um, as a black uh, anthropologist, not, not saying that there is no black anthropologist, but as a black anthropologist, uh, in Canada, it, it's very, uh, it's, it's far and few between in terms of employment, it's far and few between thing, in terms of the relevance of the research as an anthropologist, uh, comparing it to the United States where there's more black anthropologists who are doing amazing work uh, in black communities. So it fit well for me to switch the, the discipline, not necessarily too far away from anthropology and sociology, um, to give me more um, more sociological perspectives on how I can add value to my work, um, but also how I can add value to the community. Excellent. Even in that discipline, being a black male sociologist in Canada, there are, how, are there many of them? Um, there's a few. Um, off the top of my head, uh, I wouldn't... I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, you know what? I, I, want, I don't want to misspeak because um, he's, he's, he's very uh, he's very well known, and I use his work to make sense of my research and in terms of black masculinity. But Carl James, yes, um, from York University. I think he's in education. If I'm, if I'm correct, yeah. Uh, um, I want to mention Tamari Katosa, who is a mentor of mine. Um, he's very poised and very um, an important part of the piece of my development at the stage of my life. So there's different um, researchers, not necessarily um, in the actual discipline of sociology, but doing research that is very closely connected to the discipline uh, through interdisciplinary research that uh, adds value to uh, you know my research and different types of research when it comes to masculinity, you know, or, or or gender studies in itself. Great. Well, let's start uh, doing the barbershop journey. Why yes. did Why did you want to do it? So for me, it was I, I, it's about uh, getting people to talk. And one of the things um, that I, I appreciate about um, academia is that there's always something to talk about. Um, but when you do conversations within the academic space, it usually leads to only ac mostly academics uh, in this space. So what was encouraging for me to do is not only um, encourage people, but the community members who. You know, and those I speak of my work, and those I'm speaking are working with the community to actually be in the space where they feel it's a safe space and the space they're common with. Um, so that's number one reason for barbershop talk in barbershops. And I'll talk about a little bit more in terms of what's happened in the Levin, which I'll, I'll, I'll shed light. But one of the reasons why I wanted to do it is because, you know, writing a, a research paper or publishing a, a, a paper only goes so far. And one of the ways of you know, including people of the community is actually meeting where they are, where, where they are. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Barbershop exists and why, we, why we're going to continue doing it and making, it, making sure it's a relevant um, program or event that people feel like they are welcome and they're always welcome to share their perspectives and their experiences of life as a black man or a black woman um, who are in relation to, to men of color. Excellent. So you came up with this idea of having this. Who was when you started sharing it with people? What was their initial reaction? Uh, the initial reaction was was positive. Um, I'll start by saying the first barbershop talk on February twenty eighth. Um, I was anticipating ten people. I was like, hey, you know what? We we um, we sent out information. Uh, to many media outlets, um, community organizations in Ottawa, and CBC Radio picked up picked up on it first, and they interviewed me um, uh, mom days before the actual event. Um, I think that's what helped encourage people to understand that this community or this community event was was happening. And from my expectation of ten, we had tw twenty to twenty five people in the room, shoulder to shoulder, where it was it was cramped. Um, so the the the. The, the event that night was scheduled, I, I laugh because I'm hoping that my um, co-organizers are listening to this part of what I'm saying. It was scheduled for only two hours, and we ended up uh, extending it to, to two extra hours. So it was a four-hour event on the 28th, where literally I had to kick people out of the barbershop and tell them to go home, it's done. 
Um, so it was it was well received prior. It was well received during, um, and it was well received after. And the numbers uh, for the barbershop talk for the eleventh, we are at ninety eight people across all three cities. So it does show it's not only a need and a want for Ottawa, but it's a need and want in Toronto. It's a need and want in Montreal. So that just proves that this is an event that is um, is needed and, and is appreciated in two different provinces. And I am sure if we uh, when we continue, we'll get the same result in different provinces in Canada. I want to cycle back to the first event in February. What was what was your thought? What what were you feeling before it started, and what were you feeling during, and what were you feeling after? Wow, um, I say wow because there's so many emotions. Um, before I was, I was keeping my composure. I, I'll, I'll let the truth be told. I was a little nervous because um, I was. I've only lived in Ottawa for two and a half years now, and I was still at that point getting to know the community, getting to know people um, and who are the allies, which was important, and stakeholders on this topic. So I was a little bit nervous. Um, right when we started, I, I felt um, the nervousness went away, and I was really happy to see the number of people pour into the barbershop. Um, during the event, um, I, was, I was very pleased and happy to hear so many people want to talk. And I, I purposely put myself in a position to not talk and to more listen. Um, one of the reasons is because of my status as a academic that sometimes um, makes people feel like I'm the truth teller and I'm really not. I only know what I know. Uh, and I am, I am one that knows nothing but knows something to add value to people. So um, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very aware of my, my, uh, my beingness or my, myself in this space. Uh, and I was able to observe and I was able to listen to comments that sounded great and some comments that didn't sound so great. But then again, it was people's perspective to the questions. Um, and I was really encouraged to see the, the passion, the emotion, um, and the, just, you know, I'm going to use this word loosely, but the dedication just to wanted to speak longer, wanting to share um, wanting to know how people were feeling, like it was, it was such an amazing moment. Um, even now, I reflect based from that uh, from that first event, and I'm just so humbled, and I'm so appreciative for those who were in the space and just wanted to share their experience of understanding what black masculinity is. Any special moments from that first event that you'd love to share with us? Um, special moment for me was understanding what blackness is in Canada. That was the defining moment for me. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, so we didn't, so before we just led up to what masculinity is or what, um, you know, any questions, uh, you know, particularly towards gender, uh, one of the first questions we asked was, what, is, what does blackness mean in Canada? And, uh, and how do people uh, perceive their own blackness? And one of, the, one of the responses that, or a few responses that were, which were in line with each other, was that um, many people of the same skin color, blackness, um, don't align or don't, don't use or don't, um, uh, I'll just say use, for better or worse terms, use the word black to represent themselves. Um, and that was that was interesting for me to understand. Well, if we don't understand, if we, there's people in our communities who look black but don't identify as black, then are we doing ourselves a justice in when we do black events? The answer could be yes. The answer could be no. And I'm not one to say either either way. But um, it was very interesting to understand how people in Canada, black people, quote unquote, uh, understand their blackness and how they navigate the world, knowing who they are with the skin they with their skin. Um, so that was my, my biggest take back for me. Even, even now I have conversation with people, um, going back to that moment and just like I'm doing now and I'm um, telling people how, how I felt at that moment. Nice. So after the first one goes by, mm -hmm. most people would wait a few months <laughs> until the next one, yeah. but you are just, you're on the push. So when did you start thinking about volume two? Okay, so there's a story behind this, and I'm going to name drop again, Elden Holder. Yeah, him. I so, uh, just just to interrupt. 
I yeah. uh, I have been speaking with Eldon Holder about three times a week in the last month. I spoke to him <laughs> for up to, was it about an hour and a half today? But we will take that conversation offline. But uh, okay. in a very okay. short period of time, Eldon Holder and I speak at least two or three times a week. We, we have met physically once. And he, he even got to the point today saying, you know what, the next time he comes to Toronto... He has to introduce his wife to me because his wife's going, who is this Dr. Vibe guy? Are, are you cheating on me or something? So just there you go. So that name, Common Bond. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text him after we finish and say, I know someone you know. Okay, well, then I think I, I, think I misspoke. I'm going to say Eldon Holder Jr. then. Okay, Jr. I've never met Jr., but Sr. I've, I've spoke to a lot. Yeah, and he's a very, very intelligent man and very uh, open and kind man as well. I've had conversations with him as well. Um, but Eldon Holder Jr., he has been um, a very supportive and very encouraging, uh, headstrong, smart individual who literally tracks me down in my hiding spots at Carleton University. I'm not going to say them over the air because they're, they're, they're important for me. They're hiding spots for a reason for so I can study. Uh, tracking me down to encourage me to, you know, to do more barbershop talks and someone who really believes in this program or the project or community event. Um, so we, we've had many conversations um, about barbershop talk and the push. So I'm starting with him, but the community, the community in Ottawa, the community in Toronto um, has definitely encouraged me to do the second one and hopefully and, and the way of doing it well, that's that's the purpose of doing the second one, um, is the push to continue this conversation and continue to uh, support and, um, and and empower people to be in the space. Um, but so I will, I'll definitely say one person for sure, Alden Holder Jr. and definitely the community in Ottawa and not only Ottawa but Toronto. Uh, and it seems that I'm not Montreal, so um, it's really it's really community driven. It's really what's making me feel good about doing it. It's really making me feel good about continuing to do it. Um, so yeah, I that's, that's how I would answer your question. So I like people who are bold, sold, and told. Was it was it in your mind to go three three cities on this one, or was it something that you consulted? And because there's a lot of logistics behind this one, because it's not just one city anymore. It's three plus. It's not only getting each event site to good to go, but also then preparing each site for live streaming. Yeah, yeah. So the re the rationale behind the three cities was um, feedback I got from the community members here in Ottawa, and one of the biggest things they said was anytime there's black that oh, black focused events it's always in an anglophone speaking uh or only toronto focus so as much as the third the second one is in toronto uh, i'll explain a little bit of that more but the main purpose of the barbershop talk in montreal is to acknowledge that concern and to also recognize that black people exist not only in an anglophone but francophone speaking um perspective right so that was part of the rationale. The second part of the rationale um, was to um, not to well try to include as many people as possible in this community event. Um, so I'm going to name drop another person who's work, working very hard, and she she's very um, very smart individual, very positive individual. And, you know, I can't ask for anybody more uh, with support from is um, Marianne Wade. Uh, LA, and she goes by. I hope she doesn't get mad at me for name dropping. Hold, but, okay, let me ask you something. Is Lorianne Wade, did she used to live in Toronto? Uh, she still does. I know who that is. Okay, perfect. So I know, I know her, her and her and older sister. Yeah, she has an older sister named Susan. Okay, um, so um, I'll start by saying when I pitched the idea to LA, um, she was so appreciative and so supportive of just helping out with the Toronto uh, hub. I call them hubs, um, the Toronto um, barbershop talk. And um, it, it, you know, if I didn't have people like Alden, if I didn't have people like LA, like, I, I wouldn't. This wouldn't. This wouldn't exist. I don't think the way it is. So I have to. I have to pay homage to those two individuals, and not only those two, but you know, Sonia and, and the dean, there's other people working with me, Mitchell in Montreal, Selena. Like I, I, I feel like name dropping them all, but. I know times against us, but you know my, my crew they have been really helping and putting this thing together, right? So um, it, 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 it's a long story short. 
you know, the reason why we're able to do three cities is because of the efforts of hard work. Um, and these people are, have full-time jobs, and they're, they, they see the relevance in this topic, and they see the relevance of, of supporting the community in this way. Well, you know what? I don't want you to get in trouble. So if you want to list them all, go ahead, because I don't want you to get in trouble. Come back to say, hey, man, you didn't mention me live. I'm going to get you. <laughs> So, you know, if you can list them all, whoever has been involved, you can certainly shout them out here, man. No worries. Oh, for sure. Thank you. So, um, like I said, L.A., Eldon, Mitchell, Selena, uh, Sean in Montreal. Uh, we've got to give a shout out to him. He's a barber that's allowing us to use a space um, in Montreal. Uh, we've got to shout out to UFT, allowing us to use a, a space in the, in the university. I keep really appreciate it. I've only known for so, such a short time, but, you know, these people really... Uh, are stepping up. Um, I have to shout out Yan, who's been very helpful in creating and helping the logistics side of things. Um, Medina mentioned Stefan, like I mentioned, um, everybody involved. Danielle, um, you know, if I, if I miss anybody, it's not on purpose. I just want to make sure my crew, as much as people at the top of my head have mentioned, but I think I got them all. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's fantastic. How much work logistically has this taken to make this happen? Because we're less than a week away. And a lot of times when people want to do follow-up events, they usually wait sometimes a year. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this because my professor is probably listening. Um, it took me a long, it took me many nights, I will say, and, uh, and uh, not running my comp. But it's done now, Jackie. It's done. Um, and it goes, um, yeah, so many nights, it, it literally, we started planning this, uh, I would say April, um, and it's been meeting after meeting, week after week with meetings, um, writing the, uh, description of, um, the details of the event, the marketing material, um, the, the, the communications material, the questions, the themes, um, ensuring that, um, everybody had an opportunity to chime in the Google Docs, which we have, and just adding value, so, it took time, um, so I would say maybe two, three months of just planning and organizing and continuously talking and continuously texting people and bothering them at all, all hours of the night um, to try and get this thing going, and um, we're here, right? Um, I can't forget uh, Suzanne at the Cultural Arts Studio here in Ottawa, um, who does definitely does some great work in Ottawa and in, in in black African and black uh, Caribbean communities. Uh, who definitely has given us space to do um, the barbershop talk here uh, in Ottawa, which is now with 40 people attending. So um, there's there's been a lot of talking, there's been a lot of emails, there's been a lot of text messages, a lot of phone calls, and a lot of long nights just trying to make this thing happen. So we're here, and like I said, I'm humbled and appreciative of everybody's efforts of putting this into work. It's not a Warren thing, it's us thing, it's a community thing. If we keep it that way, uh, we'll, we'll better our communities. Well, I just want to shout out some people that are either retweeting or watching us live on the live end. From my end, I see ADW. Thank you. Also, a retweet by a gentleman that if you want to get introduced to a gentleman who, who talks about ma black masculinity, it's one of the gentlemen that's a mentor for me. His name is Dr. Tommy Curry. He yeah. is a giant when it yeah. comes to this yeah. thought. And I've actually had him on the Dr. Vibe show a number of times. Yes, 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 I'm definitely, definitely I'm actually reading his book, uh, and I, I use a lot of his work on the man lot. Yep. Uh, if, if I can just give a shout out on that book, it is, it is amazing. It, it, he's done an amazing piece, piece of work that long time, time coming, coming doesn't indicate that there's, there's, there's many authors, uh, one of my, my favorite, favorite authors, 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 friends, and on. on. Yep. Uh, talks about the black male body and the decolonization, the decolonization. But, but um, time I'm here, I'm going to say it is, is remarkable. remarkable. Um, the Lego 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 you yeah, well, look them up online, folks. And also, if you want, go to the Dr. Vibe Show site, put in Tommy Curry in the search engine. You will see some epic conversations with Dr. Curry on this platform. I, When Tommy Curry speaks, I shut up and I listen because he, he, is, he is on point in a large way. 
Uh, I could go one or two avenues. I'm going to go this avenue. You have specific themes for this event yeah. coming up. Why did you choose these themes? Like, I, masculinity is part of it, but you're gonna you're talking about black young men and their mothers, masculinity, single motherhood, gender relations. Why those subjects? Okay, so, um, one thing about you know gender, when we understand it, it's not it's, it's not socially constructed, constructed in one way. When we think about gender, um, especially when it comes to black men, there's this misconception that men only develop men, and that's I think that's that's incorrect. Um, what, it mean, what we should um, encourage ourselves to understand is that women play a huge role in the development of young men. Um, and when we talk about, I just want to just, um, just you know, pedal back a second here. Uh, when we say mothers, it's not just the biological mothers. Um, we do acknowledge in these in these events or this com coming event that we are talking about sisters, cousins, friends, aunts, grandmothers, uh, stepmothers who who have taken on motherly roles for young men as well. Uh, so we don't want to, we don't want to not acknowledge them. But this theme about women raising men, black men, is important. I think it it, it um, misses the the good work that many women have done and contributed to young men's masculinities. Um, but also, it, it it's an opportunity to discuss, you know, what what's the importance of what's the relevance of. Uh, one thing we've done with this uh, barbershop talk event is we. Now, we're not going to have a qualitative approach, we're going to have a quantitative approach. We've asked people to fill out a online survey, um, just ask them closing questions about how they feel about women um, offering uh, helping the development of said young men. Um, and with that, with that, with that in direction, it helps to formulate the questions as, as you see them in terms of what's what's important in the mother son relationship, um, what's the significance of. Um, and once, you know, it's an opportunity for people not only to dig deep and understand what that is, but to share their experiences, because, again, it's, we can't look at gender one way. It comes in so many different ways, and it's, it's understood differently by many different people. So this topic itself is just another way of understanding black masculinity um, from another perspective. Excellent. Fantastic. What is it with black... That, you and I will know this, but others may not know this, what is it about black men in barbershops that's so special in your opinion? You know, it's, I mean, I think for you and I, I, mean, I cut my own hair, but, well, I cut, I should, I should so, do I. Hair, so do I, so do I. I line up my own hair, but when I go to the barbershop, um, it, for me, it's a moment to, you know, to be, if I can be very frank, just to talk, talk it, talk it out with people, right? Um, you know, I, I'm a very busy guy at times, and you know, that, that moment at the barbershop helps me not think about the papers I have to write, helps me not think about the courses I have to teach, helps me not think about, you know, the things that i got to approach after the barbershop. You know, I'll sit down with my barber, Mo, um, you know, shout out to Mo from, you know, Right Cut here in Ottawa. You know, he's he's definitely been an ear to listen, um, an ear for, uh, an ear for, to, for listening to, to me, but I, 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 for him at times, but that relationship is so important for me because, I'm able just to just be worn and not be worn the academic or worn like oh the creative barbershop talk. It's just me just being able to talk and talk on various topics, right? Even like um, moments where we we have like a, we had a side bet on the NBA playoffs this year, right? So we uh, Mo and I got really acquainted in terms of texting each other after the after some basketball games and just talking about what had take place. And I used that as an example to show. The relationship between my bar, my barber at least, and myself is so important because I'm able to express myself in ways that I don't have to feel pressured, and he's not judging, you know. And um, many other black men feel the same way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what's important as well is to realize and recognize that, you know, although you know many are, you know, the, the barber themselves aren't recognized as this, you know, social worker or or psychologist. But they have some interesting tips, and they have some interesting feedback and perspectives about life. And I think it's very it's, it's important for us to acknowledge as well. Um, it's definitely helped me look again my relationship with my barber helped me look at things differently and think from another perspective, which has added value to my life. Right. So if I if I can take that away from the relationship from my barber, then I'm sure 100 percent sure that other people are doing the same thing. Other black men, or even women, who get in their haircuts. I've seen women in the space getting their haircuts. So. The barber is such an important uh, resource as a human being for many people, which sometimes we, we don't really think about critically because 
Um, the time we spent, sh the sh it's a short amount of time we spend in that chair, or we've never had time to really digest uh, what has taken place within the relation between barber and the people, right? So, so the barbershop talk is not only like acknowledging that relationship, but again, understanding how important that relationship is for that community. And again, I'm, I'm not the creator of barbershop talk, so I'm not taking that kind of fame. Um, this is just an, an addition to the, the good work that's been happening in barbershops and the conversation that's surrounded different topics. Okay. When I look at black masculinity, a lot of times I put it in three categories. Percep yeah. Perception, expectation, and representation. Yeah. Could you expand, if you're comfortable, on each one of those areas when it comes to black masculinity, perception, expectation, and representation? Um, I think I'll start with expectation. The expectation of black, uh, black young men, I will say from there, I'll use my experience as well, that we're, we're not, we're underachievers. We're not going to um, be able to pursue post-secondary education. Um, the expectation is that you'll be a criminal or you'll do criminal behavior or get into criminal behavior. Um, and, that's a, and that's an expectation from a lot, from a lot of people um, in our community about black men, which is a misconception. There's black men such as yourself. There's black men, like I mentioned, you know, Tommy Curry in the United States. Black men such as Alvin Jr., Alvin Bubble Jr., Alvin Bubble Sr. Those are black men who are doing some phenomenal things in the community, but the, the expectation is not to talk about those black men. The expectation is always continuing the narrative of the, the, the negative stereotypes of said black men. And, that, and that's the stereotype that continues, the expectation that continues to play and hinder the development of black young men, black men in general. Um, so that's the expectation. The representation of, of black men, which kind of ties to that, um, is, is, is one that, you know, again, is media-driven, um, uh, mainstream media-driven, is that you're looking at black men who, um, who are, you know, Toronto, for instance, right now, is going through a lot of, um, you know, shootings, murders, killings, what, 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 what have you, and that is being the main topic of, of black men. But if you think about it critically, what is that doing? That's superimposing a narrative of all black men. That's superimposing a narrative to say that, you know what, regardless, you know, individual, white, you know, other black doesn't matter, can look at young, a, a black man and say, you know, he's probably the next one who's going to do some disruptive stuff. Or he's the next one who's going to do something that, like, um, that's going to cause some type of uh, nuisance in our community. And that's not, that is not the story of all black men, right? White men do, 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 um, do criminal activity too. It doesn't, criminal activity does not specifically attach to only black men. And the narrative right now in most times is that black men are this and only attached to that, uh, attached to that criminal, that criminal uh, understanding. Uh, so this is very, uh, the expectation, representation, what was the third one, sir? I will just bring it back up here. Perception next. No. Perception, expectation, and representation. Perspective, uh, expectation, representation. Okay, so, um, so yeah, the perception right now, I think it all ties together, to be very frank. Um, I hope I'm not repeating myself in many, many ways, but um, the perception of, of said black men, again, is that, you know, they, they, are, they, they are hypersexual, um, or they are uh, one of the no line. They, they don't have, they don't, they don't know how to articulate themselves. An example that happened to me in Ottawa, um, I went to visit one of my friends who work in, in, the, in, the, in an institution here. I won't mention the institution because I don't want to get anybody in trouble here, but um, I went to go visit her one afternoon, and uh, her colleague looked at me and said, oh, sorry, do you belong to her? Right? So, the, you know, my response to that was, no, I don't belong to anybody. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is the perception is that a, a black man, regardless of, and, and I'm an educated black man. I have I have my degrees, I, and that's not to put anybody's face. But you know, the perception is, it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter you know what you've gone through and how your 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 positive impact in the community. You know, the perception is that we don't want to get to know the black man. We don't want to know what they're all about. But we're going to superimpose these negative stereotypes on that black man's body, so it continues to plague him and villainize him in certain ways where he cannot find upper mobility in society. So the perception is always to um, and generalize black men and put them down this place where, you're, you know, again, it, it, it impedes on their, again, social mobility.
Okay. Gonna give you a statement here and see how your see what your response is. When it comes to black masculinity, there's mixed emotions. Many white people fear it, but many black people worship it. Do you feel that's true? Um, I think I think there's truth in what you're saying. Um, I think you know it's very it's very, we have to be very cautious when we say white people. I, I like to when I when I'm writing I just finished writing my exam as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Instead of generalizing all white people, that is wrong. I think what we need to be very aware of is uh, white, white settler thinking. That's what I, I, I use in, in the paper. What I mean by that, it's an ideology. And then the ideology reinforces um, a, a particular topic, which we're talking about is race, in terms and then superimposing the, the negative stereotypes based on this ideology um, on how to uh, perceive certain people. So I don't want to say white people generally, because mentor, mentors that I have who are white um, have been there at my worst times and still here, like literally, um, you know, they have, they don't see me as that, you know, criminal or, or bad guy, right? They see me as Warren Clark and his character. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. Number two, um, I think it can go both ways. I think, um, there's, there's people in the black community definitely see the value and the importance of acknowledging uh, black men or yeah, men and boys, um, and then there's some there's some that uh, that don't, and I think I think that's you know the result of the effects of colonization personally. Although that's uh, it comes from you know the work of Fanon um, and someone who I use in my work. However, um, I think it, it it all depends on the individual and how they perspective how they how they view the world. Um, so I, I will say in a white settler nation state Canada, which we live in. I think the norm is um, for more, more so white people to view black bodies or black men in a certain way, but does not um, insinuate all white people are the same. Um, you know, it's really important to understand that, especially when living in Toronto, you know, thinking about you know the East Coast of Canada and you know this the, the marginalization, the oppression that black black bodies go through there, even now. Be, uh, you, know, you know, black people in Nova Scotia are still trying to get land that was promised them from years ago, right? And, you know, the acknowledging, you know, who, who's the power relations and also the social structural um, relation among people, uh, which is highly white in um, it does plague the, again, I'll go back to the same term, social mobility of blacks. But again, I, I really, and I'm repeating myself purposely because I do want to ensure that uh, you know, it's said in, 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 in a context that all white people are not the same. It's that's 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 wrong, and we should we should be very aware of that. Okay, is there a difference at all between black masculinity and white masculinity? Yeah, hundred percent there is. Um, you know, when you when you look at you know, first off, you have to also understand class class relations. But I'm going to answer the question straight up first. I'm going to bring class into it. Um, when you look at you know white masculinity in general, it's perceived as a dominant or hegemonic in a hegemonic way, and, um, and that means that there's power attached to that, patriarchy attached to that, um, and when it's in relation to black masculinity, it it it, it forces or it in it, it, it shapes black ma black masculinity in such a way where it's demonized. So, and Tommy Curry talks about this in the Man Not. He talks about this as a, you know, as in relation to white and black masculinity, as relates to white masculinity, um, it's black masculinity is feminized, and then it's feminized in a way where it doesn't, it doesn't even come close or can be in the same relation to white masculinity. Um, but then again, you have to also think about class. Class is an important factor because you have, you do have low socioeconomic white people, white men who don't measure to a higher socioeconomic white men. And then and their masculinity is also demonized. So it's really important, important to understand the social dynamics of what of masculinity, but in general, and in terms of black masculinity and white masculinity, there is no comparison. There is well, there's a comparison, but there is no. They're not the same, um, and, and it continues to be that way uh, even in our contemporary times. Nice. What effect does the hip hop culture have on black masculinity, in your opinion? Oh, oh man, man. Um, you know I, I come, come from a different, different era. Era, sorry. Um, I am from the you know early '90s, Wu Tang, Raekwon, that type of those joints where 
Um, you know, you know Tupac, Tupac, Biggie, but Tupac, Tupac was my man, man, right? That's why I'm pointing that out real quick. Tupac was my man. Um, you know, you know, they were they were discussing, you know, real life. Not saying that you know today's era is not discuss real life, you know, uh, situation or life or life about you know, their their growing up or whatnot. But I related to that generation more so uh, personally. Um, in terms of hip hop now, I think you have you know artists such as Drake, you have artists such as um, Kendrick Lamar. Um, you know. Yeah. I don't know too much new artists these days, to be honest with you. I'm not really following that scene, but to answer your question, I think it does play a role in, in shaping how young men or men understand their masculinity. Um, and understanding it in such a way in context to the, the, the social environment we're living in. I think social media has um, uh, boomed in such a way where um, you know, hip hop is used as a, as a, a, a mobilized certain different uh, ways of thinking about masculinity. Uh, which in, in, in essence has developed a way, uh, developed, developed with, with, with some men, or young men as well, to understand their masculinity in such a way where they, they're more, they're more uh, in, in social media, even taking pictures or videos or whatnot, um, and, and shaping it through that sense of what I, if I can say so much. Um, I know I'm talking a little vague, but I think with, with hip hop in itself, I think it's. Um, it's definitely um, it's still a mobilizing tool in understanding how some young men or men themselves understand their masculinity uh, in, in relation to different types of uh, situations. So, um, you know, and again, I'm not pretty too I'm not pretty too into the hip hop scene like I, I used to be, but you know, coming from my era, you know, when I listened to Tupac, uh, some of the you know, some of those films either had me motivated to. You know, get on the road and do something, or, or go to the gym, or go play basketball. So, um, you know, again, I'm not really, I'm not really too, I'm not too familiar with going to hip hop scene right now. So I don't know if I gave that question justice or not. No, it's okay, no problem. We, when we spoke off air, uh, I believe it was this past Saturday, you were telling me, and you've mentioned, I think, briefly how successful the registrations have been for this, the volume two. Yeah. Which I would say that is one success already. What would make, in your opinion, Volume Two successful? Um, you know, to be very honest with you, I think just people coming out and sharing their experiences. Um, that that to me is uh, is success. I think um, people leaving and wanting more. That would be a definite definite indicator of success. Uh, in terms of how um, people are seeing the need to continue this conversation. Um, so I, that's what I see playing out. I think that's what's going to happen anyways. From, from the survey, I'm noticing the, the comments and the responses to the questions. So um, those are the two things that, that come to mind in terms of how this event will be successful. And seeing, I'll, I'll piggyback on what you just mentioned, you know, the numbers themselves have, has definitely shown that you know, people are wanting this event. People are encouraged to be in the space. I have people um, that were registering under one name, purchasing two or three tickets, which I didn't even know until earlier this week. Uh, <laughs> it's awesome. So, which which is an indicator that people are not only motivating themselves, but they're motivating other people. Right. Right. So, um, I think again, the, you know, the, the success is already um, is already identified, and I think the community is definitely set the tone on. On uh, seeing this as uh, a successful event before it started, because they're 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 really encouraged and really um, interested in, in being a part of the space. Have you started planning Volume Three already? Actually, I have. <laughs> I've been good for you. But 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 don't tell my supervisor. <laughs> no, no. We'll, we'll, this will be a private viewing only. Private viewing yeah. only. With the success of requests of people wanting to attend the event, have you capped? More, uh, any other people attending the event live? Um, live, no. So there is no cap live on uh, the webinar, if I'm answering your question correctly. No, I'm not going in space. person, in person, in the space. Because okay. obviously Sorry, you've had a high demand in, in the spaces for, for people attending. Yeah, so um, originally I, I, we set the bar at 25 people, and then I got an influx of emails Saying, Warren, I can't register. Why can't I register? And I, I was oh. one of those people. But I, <laughs> I, did, I didn't email you, but I said, what's going on? And then the next day I was able to get in. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, you, you are one of those people. So um, so what I did was I, I made sure that we had enough space. So uh, I went down to U of T this past weekend um, uh, with, uh, with LA and, and, and IT, if I can mention their name again. Yep. Uh, we got a we got a bigger room um, to hold the the event. So it's going to be in the University of um, uh, Toronto U of T uh, Library, University of Toronto Library. Um, it's going to hold at least 60 people. Good. I'm anticipating drop-ins. I'm anticipating people just walking in. So that's one of the reasons why we moved to a bigger location there. So thanks again, Ike in LA. Um, the uh, cultural arts studio uh, can fit. So we have two rooms just in case. Um, so we, we, we will be fine there. So we, we've increased the numbers from 25 to 40 on every location. And Montreal is still growing right now. So if you haven't bought your ticket, or sorry, bought, it's free. My, my apologies. No if you haven't registered for your tickets in Montreal and you're in Montreal, there's limited spaces, but you got to get them now because uh, people are picking them up like there's no other. Okay, can you give, sort of give us a vision on what this is going to look like? Like, how is it going to be done? Is there is a, com is a different conversation in each location? facilitated by someone is that the way it's going to look exactly exactly so each each city is going to be facilitated by an individual okay, okay so ottawa i i will be um co-facilitating with ottawa and what it's gonna it's gonna look like if i can try to paint a picture for people and yourself yes, sure we're gonna have people um well we're gonna try to have 20 seats uh, on one side of a room the 20 seats on another side so the people situating in those seats will be facing each other and then have and then speaking to each other. The only the only drawback from that is if someone's sitting beside you, then you'll have to turn your 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 turn to the side to listen to them. But that's not a huge takeaway. The purpose for the the face to face interactions so people can see each other, right? Now you can do that in a circle as well, but I found it more effective when doing these events when people face each other in an event and in a conversation this way. Um, it, it's it's been more um, for me, and I found and the feedback I've got has been more um, enlightening. It's been and and also just seeing emotions and seeing how people really react to certain things. So uh, it's worked out that way. And the facilitator themselves would be in the middle of the room or um, the the yeah middle of the room, and they will be asking the questions. So the facilitators um, will not necessarily be chiming in too much. Uh, because we don't want to superimpose a truth or define things for the crowd. We want the crowd to be able to uh, speak freely, um, respecting the space, respecting people's indi uh, individuality and their perceptions to certain questions and things. Okay. And you have the facilitators pick for each location, correct? Correct, correct. So the facilitators in Montreal is Selena and Alden Jr., uh, Alden Holder Jr., and myself and Arnold and John. Uh, who's another person I didn't, I didn't mention? Sorry, John. My no, you back. got him in now. No worries. Uh, and then uh, LA and IKE uh, who will be in Toronto, helping to facilitate. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time because uh, the countdown is on, and I'm sure there there are already emails in your box from just the time we spoke and say, "How can I get in? How can I get in?" It yeah, is, my phone's been buzzing on my lap. Literally, there you go. I, well, you know, phone. yeah, I don't want to take you away yeah. from this. Are there any final words you'd like to share with us in regards to this event coming up on July 11th? Yeah, um, just the community. Uh, I really thank everyone who has um, signed up for the event. Um, I really appreciate people showing an interest. I'm sorry if I haven't returned any emails yet specific to anybody. I will. Slow, busy. Please excuse my busyness, um, but um, to the community, regardless of what ethnic background, really appreciate you. Please come out. Um, please register, but please come out <laughs> once you've registered, um, and please just come and share and come and learn and, and or observe. And also, I'll just piggyback on that. If you can't make it physical, it's also available on a live stream. Exactly. Thank you. So th that's important piece. If they want to find out any more information, what can they do? Where can they go? Excellent. So we have a Facebook page, um, Black Masculinity, a Misconception of Black Masculinity. Um, also, my Facebook page, Warren Clark. I 
I'm trying to get into Twitter, but it, it, it takes up so much of my time, and I, I haven't got time to really <laughs> resources. Into it. Resources. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting into Twitter, and hopefully, be better at it soon. Um, you can always email me um, at uh, my email address, uh, which I think will be on the link uh, with Dr. Vibe. Or I can say really quickly that Warren G. Clark, Clark with an E, at gmail.com. Um, that's the easiest way of getting in touch with me, um, or Facebook. Okay, well, that is it. So if you are in Toronto on July 11th, even if you're not in, if you're not in Toronto, if you're not in Montreal, if you're not in Ottawa, you can watch this live screen. Live stream, screen, live screen, and live stream. It's a live stream yeah. and live stream. Thought about that. So please check it out. It is an epic conversation. I am going to be there. I found a way of getting a ticket before the onrush. So I'm going to be there. And uh, certainly, uh, I will certainly contribute to another epic conversation that will be happening at this event. I am Dr. Vibe, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of epic conversations. I'm the host of epic conversations. If you want to watch replays of my YouTube conversations, you're at the place. If you want to listen to audio replays of my epic conversations, you can go to the website, the dr, v -I -B -E -S -H -O -W com. Also, Apple Podcasts. There's a few other places. Let me just check it out here. Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, Google Play Music, iHeart Radio, and another platform coming in the near future. Selected audio replays are available at thegoodmenproject.com, where I've been a regular contributor for four years, for almost five years now. Also, WJMS Radio out of New York City. I'm a certified empowerment coach, president and CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching Communications. If you would like a complimentary session, please reach out to me. Twitter at drvibeshow, email drvibe at the drvibeshow.com, or you can go to my website, go to the top, click on Contact the Dr. Vibe Show, and right there you can contact me via email, video message, or audio message. I am, too, a brand ambassador for the only online magazine dedicated to African Americans in food, wine, and travel. The name of the magazine is Cuisine Noir Magazine. Website address is CuisineNoirMag.com. If you are a business or entrepreneur and you'd like media promotion, I operate a service called Getting Media Coverage, where I help businesses and entrepreneurs get media promotion so they can elevate their business, product, or service. Next up, most Monday evenings at 9 p.m., Eastern Time, if you go to the Dr. Vibe Show, I'm doing a series in collaboration with the Good Men Project called You, Me, and CTE. And if you don't know what CTE is, it is the brain disorder that a number of athletes these days are suffering after playing sports where their head is getting hit, such as football and hockey. So that is going on for the probably the rest of the summer. That's another epic conversation coming up. Two other things with me, uh, if you are in Niagara Falls, Ontario, on the, between September 9th, uh, September 7th and September 9th, I will be one of the speakers at the Truth Conference. And also, in November, I believe November 18th, I am the Master of Ceremonies for the 2018 Men and Women's Summit on Masculinity. Come to, Go to my website, you'll get more information on that. Last three things I'd like to say, first of all, Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Next up, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. And finally, block assumptions. I'd like to thank everyone who watched this live or on the replay. God bless. Peace be well. And as we say in my heritage, walk good. And thanks for watching. Take care. God bless. Peace be well and keep the faith.